Hey everybody, my name is Jim Scott, and today I'm here to talk to you a bit about models and data and introduction to model fitting. Um, and so uh, to get the ball rolling, I, I just thought we could take a quick look at uh, this model that's been fit to some data. And my question to all of you is, do you think it's a good fit? Um, and why, why not? Um, so think about that. We'll come back to this a little bit later on. I'll give you just a couple of seconds to Think about that for a minute. Um, and this will show up a little bit later. Um, so what are we doing and why are we here? So what I'd like to do uh, in this series of short videos is talk a little bit about um, classical epidemiology and how it differs from mechanistic epidemiology, what those things are. Um, take a step back, look at the big picture and ask ourselves, why, why bother fitting models to data? Why is it useful? Um, look at an example of something that we should all be familiar with uh, when we fit a linear model in a statistical sense to data, like in linear regression, how does that work? Um, and then something that might not be as familiar to most people, um, another way we can fit models to data using maximum likelihood estimation. And in fact, how we can use that type of model fitting um, to fit dynamic models to data. So that that's where we're going. So I think everybody's probably familiar with classical epidemiology when we're trying to just identify risk factors or potential causes um, to a disease. So in this case, we're looking at literacy and HIV infection. Um, and so what we could do is design a study, um, go out and collect some data on our explanatory variable, our response and um, potential confounding variables, and then build a model and come up with a relative risk or an odds ratio that gives us, after we control for things, hopefully as close as we can get to a causal estimate of what the relationship is. Um, so traditionally, um, that's what we would do in, in epidemiology. Uh, but in mechanistic epidemiology, we do things a little bit differently. Um, it's not at the individual level per se, but we're talking about uh, a system, uh, the population level, and we're specifying how things are all interacting, how they're mixing. Um, and so, for example, in an SIR model, um, we have a system of equations that governs how um, people are moving between susceptible, infected, and recovered states. Um, and so with this type of model, we can answer questions that are often much harder, to, that would be much harder to answer um, with traditional epidemiology. Um, by just changing some of these parameters. So I like to think of it um, from a causal inference framework about counterfactual scenarios. So maybe this is uh, one scenario when we've parameterized the model a specific way, but what if we change things, um, go back in time and change things and, and run forward through time and see what happens then? We can start answering more complex questions. So for example, what if each person in our population expose 50% more people. Well, that amounts to the transmission rate increasing. And so we can see um, in this scenario, it's lower, this is higher, and what happened over time in the population? More people became infected, you have an epidemiologic curve that's bigger. Um, or for example, what happens if we treated people and doubled the, the rate of recovery? In that case, we might be able to prevent the epidemic from ever happening in the first place. Um, so here the recovery arrow is bigger. Or um, we could try to identify, well, what is the transmission rate? What is the parameter that governs transmission in our model? And try to zero in on it. So for example, maybe here's our um, observed epidemic curve. Um, and how can we identify what the transmission parameter is. Maybe we put forth one possible transmission parameter and see what the epidemic curve looks like with that value. Here, it clearly doesn't fit very well. It doesn't fit the actual data. So we know that um, we'd have to change it. We'd have to maybe increase it until we got a better fit. Um, so we can get a better estimate of what the actual transmission parameter is, holding all the other things constant. Um, and then uh, just like with traditional statistics, we can get um, confidence intervals um, for these types of parameters as well. 
we can make predictions, what's going to happen in, in the future. And then maybe we wanna you know, choose between different models um, that predict different outcomes based on potential interventions. So here we have in the purple, um, what happens if an intervention is introduced at a particular point in time and what we might expect versus if nothing happened at all. So what sorts of scenarios can we come up with in our model world? And so this idea uh, of a model world is something that we'll be talking about um, throughout the week. Um, but I like to think of it as really just you know, this counterfactual world where you can go back and change things and see what, what different realities might, you might encounter. Um, and just briefly mention that uh, a lot of this has really uh, developed, a lot of this type of work has developed in the last 10 years, in part because of the com computational power and the availability of software to, to do stuff like this um, in terms of mechanistic epidemiology. So we've had ideas about it, but we're actually putting it into practice now. Um, so why is fitting models to data useful? Maybe it's a good time to pause right now and see if you can come up with a few uh, reasons why you think fitting models to data is useful. So maybe just take a minute or, or pause the video. And then once you have a few in mind, let's compare it with what, what I've prepared or what we have in the slides here. So why, why fit models to data? So I think one of the, the big ones is we want to estimate parameters of interest. So that's one of the things we like to do in statistics. We use sample statistics to estimate population parameters. Um, and a lot of the times models are a part of that, right? We look at some data uh, and then we choose a model because maybe it looks linear, we choose a linear model and then we fit it to the data to estimate slope. Uh, and then we can ask questions about that parameter, about the slope. So another reason fitting models to data is useful, I think, is um, to test hypotheses about those parameters, inference, statistical inference. What sorts of things can we infer about these underlying parameters? Are they plausible? What values are plausible? What values aren't plausible for parameters? Um, and then oftentimes we, we just want to assess, is this model even plausible, right? Is there any way that, uh, you know, given the model that we have, that it could fit the data? Or is it just completely out of the ballpark? Um, or does one model uh, do better than another? Uh, does one model fit the data better um, than some other candidate model? So usually we, we prefer parsimony, right? So if we can choose a simpler model and it does uh, no worse of a job than a more complex model, then we usually go with the, the simple model, only introducing complexity when we really, uh, when it's demanded. Um, but really, we fit models to data because we want to be able to understand patterns in the world uh, and sometimes even to predict what might happen in, in, in the future. I think those are sort of the key, the key reasons. So if those are some of the ones that you had written down, bravo, great job. Um, and maybe you had some additional reasons that I didn't mention here. Um, there are other reasons we might want to fit models to data too. These are just some of the key ones that um, we came up with. Um, and so in a minute, we'll, we'll talk about going through actual, actually the process of fitting a statistical model to data. Um, that's something that we're, we're familiar with. Um, we, do, we could do the same sorts of things with dynamic models, the same methods that we use when fitting statistical models, we could also do with dynamical models. Um, one of the main differences between statistical models uh, and classical epidemiology and uh, dynamic models is the type of data that we're, we're going to be fitting. Um, so in statistical models, we're often just interested in identifying what variable is associated with what other variable. So you can imagine just a simple scatter plot, right? Maybe it's a cross section of what those two variables were. In dynamic models, we're almost always dealing with time series data, which usually that's not what we're doing when we're fitting statistical models. So what's happening over the course of an epidemic? What's happening through time? How is the number of susceptibles changing, the number of infected, the number of recovered people changing? And then what we'll do when, when we fit models, um, we can talk about informally fitting them and then formally fitting them. 
And then uh, what do I mean uh, when I say that? So an informal fit might be just, is it even possible that um, this model can predict um, with any sort of reasonable accuracy what actually happened? Um, so in this example here, it looks like this model does a reasonable job. Um, and that's just maybe just eyeballing it, changing parameters and seeing if we can get our model to recreate something similar to what happened in reality. That's sort of an informal fit. A more formal um, model fitting procedure, um, we could ask, what's the probability that uh, this model um, could predict uh, or, or what's the likelihood or the probability that our model as specified um, could, could generate um, patterns that we actually see. Um, so we can attach a probability uh, to how uh, one model does um, compared to another, let's say. Um, and we can compare those, those probabilities. Um, and so that, that's a more formal process. We'll talk much more about this uh, uh, in, in a future short video. Um, and so I think that's a good place to pause. And I will see you all again uh, shortly.